So my name's Graham. I um, am the chief scientist with Interaxon. Uh, we make uh, electroencephalography systems for consumers and for researchers. Um, very low cost ones, uh, high volume, and they actually are primarily oriented toward uh, consumers and consumer use for neurofeedback and neurofeedback assisted learning. Um, we got our start with uh, making experiences for audiences. Uh, this is uh, 20 people hooked up to different EEG systems, and each of them is driving a different component of a symphony or a cacophony, depending on what your perspective is. Um, uh, the, uh, the origins of how we got here was in trying to create a BCI, a brain-computer interface, um, to drive uh, control of uh, cur mouse cursor and interactions in augmented reality back in 2000, 2001 in Steve Mann's lab at the University of Toronto for wearable computing. Um, so this is Chris, our, our, one of our founders, who was uh, wearing you know, this, this, what they called ITAP, 640 by 480 thing that required that you have a giant backpack on. Um, and we got into brain-computer interfaces in, the, in an effort to make um, interaction with this interface more intuitive and, and easier. Uh, it turned out that that didn't work at all. Uh, it's very, very difficult with EEG to get, uh, especially sparse EEG, to get uh, enough degrees of freedom to control an interface. But in the process of building this thing, um, and we, you know, we took that whole thing to the Vancouver Olympics and uh, drove the lights on the parliament buildings in, in Canada and, and, uh, and that's on the CN Tower on Niagara Falls, um, it turned out in the, that in the process of, of building this, what Chris learned was that uh, you had to learn how to control your attention in order to push the signals around for this BCI that we were trying to build, and accidentally taught himself meditation. Uh, so it, the, the tool became not a BCI for the control of augmented reality, but a meditation learning tool, um, neurofeedback-assisted meditation. And there seems to be some evidence, pretty strong evidence now, I think, um, that or strengthening in any case, that this actually works to teach meditation. Uh, we're getting some interesting outcomes from this, that uh, people acquire the skill a little bit faster than they otherwise would. Um, they stick to it, so adherence to a program or a learning uh, program is, is a little bit better. Um, and the way that this works is it's very straightforward. You pop in your headphones, you put on the CEG system, you connect it via Bluetooth to your smartphone, and it puts you in a virtual auditory environment. So the weather changes with shifts in attention. So as your attention um, is, stays flat and focused, it, um, the weather is calm. As your, as your uh, attention shifts, we pick up these signals that we, we interpret the EEG in a way that allows you to, uh, that allows us to change the weather. Um, so there's a dynamic environment where you get a thunderstorm when you're mind wandering and, you're, and your, your goal is to use those cues to, to focus your attention. Okay, so there's a whole bunch of gamification built into this. People get really into brain stuff, as I'm sure you know. So you try to give them numbers, and they get really hooked on those numbers, and then you have a problem, because people are hooked on numbers that are kind of a little bit made up. They're derived from EEG, num uh, EEG metrics. Um, so that's an interesting thing we learned, and then that, uh, that's, a, that's still a problem we're trying to solve, is how you make this as veridical as possible when in the kind of feedback you're giving people. Um, you know, we see some interesting neuroplastic effects in longitudinal studies of this. So after about four weeks of use, you see augmentations of the P3 response in uh, things like the Stroop task. You see reductions in reaction time um, or in reaction time variance on the Stroop task. And you see reductions in things like perceived stress and improvements in the brief symptom inventory. Okay, so we made this cool thing. It sort of works uh, for most people. Uh, and that made us think, what do we, how can we put this into a form factor that is more engaging and easier to use? So one of those form factors was uh, eyeglasses. We can make a four-channel system based, built into sunglasses, eyeglasses. You can put prescription lenses in this. This is very easy for people to wear. Another is neuroadaptive virtual reality. Because you have all of this surface area all over the, the scalp, with a virtual reality system, you can put electrodes um, on it, and you can, um, you can capture data from a variety of different locations on the scalp. You can do you know, uh, visual tasks. You can do auditory tasks. You can do cognitive stuff. And you've got nice whole head coverage for doing some interesting stuff, and even source localization. Um, the big advantage of this is not so much that it's, um, the signal quality is as good as a, a, as a laboratory system. It's not because you know, you've got a dry electrode system and it's sparse, but that the cost is so low that you can use it on a lot of people and the setup time is very short. Uh, so you can get you know, comparable signal quality between um, ActiChamp and Muse, but the cost is on the bottom right here pretty significantly different and the setup time is shorter. So at the level of population, so we collect data um, and we save it to a cloud database to drive part of the experience for our users. And this allows us to dig into the data. We ask, you know, we do um, appropriate consent. Um, we ask people to share their data with us. And this is some data from Allison Sekuler's lab at McMaster. It's, a, it's our user data, and they analyzed this and looked at the change in alpha peak frequency and age. So there was some indication that alpha peak frequency changed with age as a result of cortical slowing. Um, 
And it turns out that this is actually a pretty linear phenomenon when we look at it from about 20 years of age up to 80. We see uh, this is about 6,000 subjects. Uh, you, we could run this on 100,000 now if we wanted to. Um, and we do, and we find you know, very similar robust results uh, that there's a very linear pattern of um, shift in the alpha, alpha peak frequency. So this is a kind of neuroinformatics analysis that we're, we're, we've, we've dug into. And the, the, um, the plots on the left here are the distributions by age, by decade. So <laughs> uh, that, that's, that's a sample size effect. Um, and it also seems to be that you know, we are selecting for people who are particularly concerned about their brain health. Um, so 80-year-olds who are using devices to learn how to meditate are probably healthier than 80-year-olds who are not. Uh, <laughs> but the interesting thing is that this you know, potentially allows us to um, detect when an individual goes off the rails um, or to look at uh, population level differences associated with um, health conditions. Uh, this is some of Randy's data from Baycrest. Um, some interesting effects on speed of learning and neurofeedback. So you see these speed of learning effects where some people pick up this skill within a minute only in very large um, sample sizes. So this was 600 subjects collected over a 12-hour period. Uh, and the effect max P only pops out above about 250 subjects when you subsample this and, um, and you know, simulate, the, uh, simulate the statistical model. So the things that we think about in neurodata, um, as a company that collects a lot of it, um, it's sparse neurodata, it's noisy, but we get insights that you otherwise don't get because you have such a large population. Uh, we get a lot of repeated measures. We think about tools for really big data. Uh, we, the tools that we need to do the kind of neurodata um, analysis that we want to do don't necessarily exist. Uh, so we work with the team at MNE. Um, Nicole from our team who's here um, has been to some of the MNE code sprints and learned about how that works and brought that into our pipeline. Who sets data standards when neurotech companies, and this is something we should all be thinking about as a community, generate much more neurodata um, than academic labs do? So if you've got uh, consumer neurodata or neurotechnology out there, um, companies will be collecting data at a faster pace. You know, we, if we can collect tens of thousands of EEG sessions per day, that's probably more than most academic EEG labs in North America combined. Uh, how can the private sector contribute to standards and to, and to tool building? Uh, and this is, uh, this is, I think, important because whoever's collecting the most data is potentially going to set the standards and um, create the tools. And it's very, very important that um, there's a lot of interaction between academic science and between um, in industry science. How do we roll out rigorous experimental protocols at scale to non-experts. So how do we make sure that science is reproducible when people who are putting these devices on their heads or using consumer neurotechnology um, are not necessarily going to be trained in the same, to the same degree as uh, people who are doing this in the laboratories? And how are we going to trust that the quality of the data is what we want it to be? How, what I think about is how I get science trainees like you guys, some of the graduate students and postdocs here, to think about private sector opportunities. So how do we get you more interested in bringing some of the skills that you've acquired in this community out into the private sector and, and really contributing and bringing best practices from the neuroinformatics community out into companies like ours. And finally, um, and I'll leave that for Richard to talk about after this, um, how do we protect IP in ways that support science versus locking it down? Um, I'll save the rest for, I guess, a little, little bit later and hand it over to our next speaker.